so uh, in in relation to what I was talking about before, actually, with the politicians who, you know, were trying to get regulations on their ability to invest in the stock market, it kind of got me thinking about this other thing. So, you know, with the Alaskan Airlines, Boeing had the door fall off. Yes. So there was this, there was this thing that floated around Reddit, which I thought was pretty funny, and I want to get your take on it. If you were in the plane when that happened, right, and you had the composure to be like, let me short the Boeing stock right now. <laughs> is that insider trading? Because you kind of have information that the public doesn't have access to at that point because you're the only ones that know what just happened. Uh, maybe if someone else is live streaming on the plane, which that to me was the wildest thing is like seeing yeah. people bust their phones out to record it. Like that would not be my first like reaction is right. not to record it in real time. But trading Boeing is brilliant. That's Did the stock go down afterwards? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you like, do you it, know how much it was hit? I, I don't know exactly how much it was hit, but I know it did... Uh, to, to, to tank it as it like seven, be. I mean but it's been tanking that's the thing with Boeing is it's it's going through a little bit of a struggle right now they got a uh man they got a nice little monopoly building all that stuff so that's tough when you can't make a make they're a, half yeah make a only, duopoly work right there's only two yeah there's only two main play other ones Airbus I think right yep exactly I'm flying uh to Vegas on the JSX actually it was part of the package where they had a uh, that option I was oh, like you're oh that's on, cool you're on JSX have you ever flied it no I've never flown that you're gonna, you're gonna like it. I think. It, I think one of the good things about it is too it's is, awesome. and and this is a good message for all the accounts out there is like if you can manifest something by putting yourself in the position, and you know obviously in this case it's the company covers it, so it's, it's, <laughs> so it's not as much. But it's uh, I think Steve Harvey talked about when you sit in first class for the first time and you experience what this is like, you're like I need to do whatever I need to in life to get back to this point, and hopefully it inspires you. Well, I'm on southwest of Vegas. I don't know how you got on oh, well. JSX to Vegas, but <laughs> it's a great, great experience. It's a nice little treat yourself thing. When yeah. you got, you'll you'll absolutely love yeah. it. And But back to the regulation front, we have other airlines trying to get JSX shut down, which mm. I'm not not a big fan of. And so, yeah, uh, lobby your local uh, your local congressman, I guess, to, uh, to help keep them afloat. Well, so that's an interesting thing actually that's happening this year, especially we get into the fintech flow of things, right? With the mergers and acquisitions uh, of sorts, right? Where mm -hmm. there's, you know, uh, JetBlue and Spirit, that was supposed to be a merger that got shut down. Yep. There's been uh, other instances where companies are not being permitted as much now to to do these to do these mergers. Well, it fig, seems like Figma and Adobe, uh, Figma and Adobe not getting approved and getting Getting canceled by, interestingly enough, the UK government. That it wasn't even like the US, like Department of Justice, shut this thing down. It was a local, uh, local party in the UK. Like not even Europe, not even the EU. It was the UK that shut down wow. a twenty-seven billion dollar acquisition by Adobe, which seems like an onerous amount of control over something that's such a big deal. And like, and from our perspective in the tech world, that then makes M and A a little bit weird because you might sign an LOI, you know, letter of intent for doing a deal but it might not get approved and it might take 18 months or two years for this thing to get rejected, at which point you've made a lot of decisions mm -hmm. along the way. And how do you make a, for example, how do you make a product investment decision if you're like, well, we might be on our own or we might be part of this big Adobe uh, yeah. organization. Like where do we want to invest at this point? So it seems really messed up that like they can't, that they rejected it. I wasn't a fan of that, but like get to these decisions faster so people can keep running companies. Yeah. I think the timeliness of it is so important. And how do you, even uh, there's a concern about the incentivize the incentivization to even start companies is there, there's a risk of well if i know that if i try to sell to somebody it's going to get shut down then is there less incentive for innovation and obviously the whole point of antitrust laws is to incentivize people to go create their own thing and they're not dealing with one monster that's just able to control the whole market but at the same time some people's motivation is to try to build something that could then get bought out and that's always a risk there too I don't think that'll, I, I'm not as big of a believer as like, I, I I think the government would have to be really onerous or really advantageous to convince people to start companies or not start companies. Like, you know, there were like tax benefits to founding Flowcast when we founded it. I knew nothing about that. It wasn't, I wasn't like, oh, it's time for me to start a, ta a company now because they, you know, rolled out this new in, like in, uh, tax incentive structure where you can get the QSBS qualification yeah. deduction. All this kind of, like I wasn't sitting there like, oh, that'll, that makes it worth it for me. It's just like, I want to start a company. I have a pain point. I want to solve it. Um, and so I, I don't know how much that would drive yeah. real, real behavior. It would have to be like a bigger incentive. Or if it was just like strategic M&A is not allowed anymore, regardless of if it's monopolistic or not, like that's a different thing. But no, I don't think it's a bit. I don't think, I, I don't think we give people credit enough for the for just 
having the passion for whatever the things that they're trying to do. We were talking before the show about Lewis and Clark. You know, obviously there's incentive to be like, I want to try to get to the West Coast. Maybe there's gold. Maybe there's a discovery of resources. Maybe there's the glory. But I think there's just also this passion for adventure and just the wanting to discover things. And of course, oh, yeah. incentives help, but you just kind of, it comes from within that this is something I want to do. Yeah. Oddly enough, we were discussing yeah. Lewis and Clark before the start of this. And yeah, you're totally spot on. You're you're definitely a risk taker and you're not scared yeah. of much stuff to take on that that kind of adventure. But so for 2024, kicking things off here at the FinTech Flow, um, just a couple housekeeping items is of course, uh, Flowcast Studios is producing the show. It's going to be now sitting on the Flowcast main channel, which is where anybody can go to get all their thought leadership and their insights. And of course on Flow Academy, anybody will be able to go get their CPE which is uh, super exciting. There's going to be a load of con- loads of content on there, and every single episode of the FinTech Flow will be on there as well as other things. So this this episode will be on the yep. Flowcast proper this channel. Are we going to shout old episodes over, or they're still going to be old on episodes? The, uh, we'll Flowcast still have a playlist over on the, on Studios. Okay. We'll have a playlist on the main channel as well, so you could watch it all in one cohesive experience. But okay. um, again, if you want to log in to Flow Academy and get CPE for it. That's great, and. Um, yeah, we encourage that. And so other things happening in 2024, you know, for as far as you're, you're concerned, um, any any hobbies that you're starting this year or New Year's resolutions That's that you're kind of starting? Uh, like anything like, this is really what I want to do in 2024. Well, I just got uh, got my new golf simulator set up. So oh. I'm very, very excited about that. I've played a, played a few rounds already. So that's been a good time. I'm, I'm hoping to get, I'll do the old, getting in a little bit of better shape. I'm turning 40 this year and I wouldn't mind being in pretty good shape heading into my 40s. So that'd oh, be awesome. Not too bad, yeah. I'm, and... Here's actually, here's an awesome one, getting a puppy tomorrow. Wow. That's very exciting. That's a we big found, one. yeah, we've, uh, my daughter's really excited about it too. We've been wanting an Australian cattle dog for a while and we don't want to go to a breeder. So it's like tough. And then all of a sudden this uh, rescue agency down in LA, like posts that they have this litter of five puppies and wow. my wife sends me the link and was like, all right, let's get down there and get one. So we got, we got one and we're picking her up tomorrow. Really Harper's exciting. getting a sibling. Yes. She's, <laughs> she's very excited about it. Very cool. So, uh, we, that let's, uh, get on. Wait, up. how about you? What what happens yeah, you got right. going on? Yeah, what do you start off with? Uh, I am really trying to focus on creating content that's relatable. It's not really like new. This is the stuff that I do. But uh, when I when I was uh, home over the holidays with my family, we created this "We're from Long Island" a video, and then with I saw it, and yep. then here at yep. Flo, at, at Flowcast, we did the uh, "We Work in Accounting" video, and those things just there's riches and niches, and so I really want to try to focus on refining and not just spreading it all across the board, but really like picking uh the niches to kind of to dive into that the, the crazy thing about me is is like what i do for work is the same thing of what i would want to do in my free time and hobbies <laughs> anyway so it's like all wrapped in the same um but no i'm just like i'm excited for uh for all the the, the sketch content and uh stuff to kind of lean into as the studio's uh, account grows and uh the one thing of as far as like a resolution goes is i want to learn this is more of like life philosophies i just want to learn to not allow myself to get impacted by how someone else feels about something like a lot of times this is relationships and you take it personally or why aren't they talking to me or somebody has a bad day on the basketball court and they're kind of like you know roughing you up a little bit you're like are they mad at me it's not always on you sometimes there's like other factors that are kind of there so don't let yourself get mad at like why can't these people understand this why can't they see this just I'm not a like philosopher, a, but are, are you delving into stoicism? I think so. Is that? I think yeah. that's where you're going. Yeah, I got a bunch of great literature yeah. around that. I got a little book in my uh, my office you can check yeah. out as well. Uh, your riches and niches comment, mm-hmm. that one lands with me. The very first pitch we ever did for Flowcast, as we were walking out of the office, I overheard one of the partners go, I don't know, it seems like a small market. And the other partner goes, yeah, but riches and niches. And then they cut us a term sheet after that. So that's like a... That I feel like that line like helped start Flowcast in many ways. Like that's an important line in Flowcast history. So anyway, little, little inside scoop there. Absolutely amazing. <laughs> Fun stuff. All right. All right. So welcome everybody to the FinTech Flow. I am Drew Carrick. This is season two. We're here. I'm Mike Whitmire, co-founder, CEO of Flowcast, inactive CPA. Excited yes. for season two. I am the active CPA, still uh, co-hosting the <laughs> podcast, and uh, we're excited this year to just be bringing you news up today. We're going to have this episode be a little more agnostic. This is 2024, a little bit of uh, what's kind of starting this year off, what news we kind of expect to see, and then how we uh, feel about the year ahead. 
So uh, new year, new hot takes, new insights, new professional education for the accounting profession and the fintech industry. Yeah. And apologies for the break. We did we did get an email with someone who was wondering when the next episode was yeah. coming out. So that's that felt good. So apologies for the break, but yeah, hoping you enjoyed today. Yeah. So let's get back in with the 2024 season now underway. This is from Accounting Today. So uh, there was an article that, uh, that was posted in Accounting Today and it had what's keeping large firms up at night and uh, large firms, mid-sized firms and small firms. And so I have up on the screen here the large firms and what's working for them. Uh, recruiting retention is by far the biggest issue that is being faced. And this is by public accounting firms, but I think this is just, it applies across the board as well to accounting teams in all industries. Yeah. And this has been a perpetual thing that's been going on. And I actually think it feeds into the fourth item here, succession mm -hmm. planning <clears throat> as well. But yeah, so 5 million plus being what's considered a large firm, I would say, yeah, at that point you are facing staffing issues and you're really having to support like a good number of clients. And so I could see this being the number one issue. And at this point, like we know this is a problem, but I was even thinking we beat the drum on this so much. Like, you know, it's, it's like, is it in my own head because we've talked about this so much, but like it is a very real thing and you see it come through on like survey after survey here. So there you go. I'm not, not all that surprised and back to our old story of like something's got to give, whether it's more compensation or better technology or more more ownership. I don't know what it is, but something's got to change. I think it's one of those things where you do have to continue to talk about it because if it just becomes a new story that trends and then goes away and then it'll come back in six months and they'll be like, oh, we're still having the same issue. The only way that, I mean, this is the qualms with like you, you protest something and it's like, yeah, but what do you want to happen? It's like, well, nothing that we can necessarily do directly, but like we need more people to know about it because the more pressure there is to make the change, the quicker the change will actually happen. Yeah. For small firms, keeping up with regulatory, regulatory changes was the biggest concern. And that oh, kind of makes sense because they don't have the resources to dedicate this staying up to date. Like larger firms, mid-sized firms, they can absorb some of that overhead. They have somebody who's dedicated to just staying up to date on accounting principles and regulations and compliance and stuff like that. Smaller firms don't really have that ability. Makes perfect sense. And smaller firms, I think it's, it's more of like that homey environment feel and you kind of have recruiting and retention, like you're only hiring one person a year. So it's not really as big of a deal, but yeah, and you're generally hiring through a network. It's not like you have some recruiting function where you're really trying to pound the pavement and hire a bunch of people. I, yeah, that reminds me of, but that that's, I'm going to go back to the, um, you know, succession planning, like for a lot of these firms, um, for example, I look at my, my mom runs a smaller bookkeeping, uh, service. Um, they would have definitely, they're not be considered large, but in the small category here that they don't maybe hire one, two people a year. It's generally through their network, like mm -hmm. trusted friends, uh, and family and stuff like that. Um, but there's not a good succession plan in place. And so when they go to retire, like what's going to happen to their firm, because you can't, it's really hard to find someone who has the ability to take over a firm like that and run it, but is not at a much bigger company mm -hmm. doing that kind of work. And so it's a tricky space to be in. And when I project that out in the future, I get, I get really wor worried about, you know, in 10 years, like who's going to be preparing tax returns? Yeah. That's, it, you know, we'll have AI doing rather like the basic simple tax returns, but who's going to be doing anything with some level of complexity or that requires some sort of planning? And it's going to be like, you're going to the big four or big, like the top 10 funds to get right. the stuff, firms to get the stuff done. So I don't know. I don't want to, I don't yeah. want to under, underweight the succession planning concern here. Cause that's, if, if there's no succession planning, there's no firm. Right. And there's no, there are fewer accountants and fewer options for us to go to. Right. And, and if you're a partner at one of those firms, like your pension kind of relies on this machine to continue growing and to continue rolling. And the risk, like you said, with the AI is actually interesting. Gen Z is very disincentivized to learn things because AI can just kind of do it automatically for you. And if you know how to prompt it properly. And again, we know that a lot of the accounting type work, you know, is some of it can be automated, but a lot of it still requires, of course, that human oversight. You still need to have the the background, you know, in accounting. Um, but it's, it's one of those more so not necessarily industry specific, but generationally wide uh, issue for Gen Z where there's just less incentive to, to even go into things like why even bother trying AI is going to you know do everything eventually anyway. Which that is, that is, sucks. That's a sad state of affairs. Yeah. It's not good. So you're saying that's kind of a regardless of career path being considered, yeah. like even if you're right. like, oh, do I become a doctor? Because one day it's like AI is going to be yeah. doing it. It's just going to tell me exactly what's, what's wrong. wrong. Yeah. I mean, so I think when it comes to the recruiting and retention, the, the biggest advice, and this is whether you're a firm or whether it's a, a, a business, is you have to find a way to make the job fun. And I don't. And the, the problem that I think a lot of companies miss the mark on that is they they define fun as like, oh, well, we'll give you like a popcorn machine, or oh, we'll give you this like game that you could play. It's it's not 
it, all those things are great. Like there's a lot of ways to have a great culture and have the other stuff and activities that you can do. But the, the reason why people leave is the work itself. They're either not enjoying it or it's more difficult than it needs to be. And I know a lot of people uh, left public accounting where I was because they got frustrated with the program of just having to deal with it. And I realized when I boiled it down, like theoretically, the work is not as boring as it comes off as. But when you're dealing with the onus of this program, which is cumbersome, checking in files, checking out files, you're doing this very strict like copy and paste drill, it's, it's not enjoyable and it's not fun. And yeah. I think investing maybe in the technology that can enable them to do their job in a more smooth way that makes it a more enjoyable work experience, focus on making the work itself a game more so as opposed yeah. to just a chore. And then you could play, you know, work hard, play hard. It's like, no, just like play with the work. <laughs> I, I, I could not agree more. Like the, at the highest level. So for example, when I explained to my wife what audit is, mm -hmm. like, I think my wife would be an excellent auditor. She would be, she doesn't trust anything. <laughs> She's very detail oriented. Yep. She has a very more strong moral compass, believes in right and wrong. And so would be very energized about finding like fraud in particular. She'd be very fired up about that. And then cares about things being done correctly. And so like finding errors would be really exciting to her as well. So when I explain it from the perspective of like kind of what you're supposed to be doing and what the, the theory and ethos of audit is, that gets her exciting. But if I were to sit there and be like, so all day you're going to copy paste data from here to here and do this and like have to do like it, it then I think it's more, so I'm just agreeing with you. Yeah. And I think it's a lot of it is like death by a thousand paper cuts. Just all the little admin stuff you have to do just makes you in some ways like resent the work yeah. that, you're, that you're doing. When if you take a step back and get to do the, there are fun, interesting parts oh, yeah. of audit. Like I think it's very, I think it's a really great profession to make sure that financial information is accurate. Right. As long as you get to do the fun parts of it and like yeah. act like an investigator, that's basically, you know, you're like, you're like an investigator. Yeah. That's, that's what it is, which is a pretty, pretty cool job. You just have to do a bunch of boring shit I, <laughs> to I, get there. Get there. I, I think if we, if we, if companies built their programs of how they do the work off of those top principles, I think it, at some point it probably was. And then it got very too much in the weeds of the details. And then those things were used to like glam up the boring work by like, well, you get to do all this stuff. And it's like, no, I don't really get to do those things. Like that's the theory behind it, but I'm doing this other stuff. But if you kind of start at the top level of like, you get to be professionally skeptical, you bet you get to investigate and take that approach to doing the work. And again, I don't even know how this works. I'm talking very theoretically here, but I think if you build the work, the programs, the systems to around those high level theories, as opposed to kind of backing into the high level theories as like a cover up for what you're actually doing underneath. So I actually have a good example for you. Um, I was working, when I was at EY, I was doing an, an audit of, of a film company. And it was a little weird because I was actually auditing the work that was being done by a consulting firm because the production company did everything in a cash basis, cash basis mm -hmm. accounting. Film accounting is really complex. So they hired a firm to come in and adjust everything from cash to gap. I then audited the gap work that was done. And the partner I was working with, a smaller firm, was a really fascinating guy who had bumped around a couple of the big four um, but also worked at a really small shop where it was like him and a partner. That was where he started his career. And I was like, man, so what's it like? You know, we have our global audit methodology with EY and all these procedures and stuff. And like, what system do you guys use? And what does that look like? And all this stuff. And he goes, yeah, that stuff is pretty unnecessary. He's like the, the best partner I ever worked with. His, his theory was let's beat up the balance sheet until I get that warm and fuzzy feeling and I'm good to sign off and move yeah. on from there. And that's like a, such a simple way of thinking about it. And it's like, yeah, let's dig into the balance sheet, see if there are any errors. And if we dig deep enough and I start to feel good about it, I'm willing to put my neck on the line and sign an audit opinion. That's it. Like move on with our lives. And if you go through all that, you're going to have the necessary documentation to prove that you went through an audit and felt good about it. And at the end of the day, it's, it's a partner signing an audit opinion and signing off on it and putting your putting your name on it. It's not about the formalized procedure that went in with, you know, at Ernst Young with like right. every single thing that went through the audit software and doing the whole reviews and everything. It's like, at the end of the day, it's a gut, is this correct or not? Do you feel good about it? And yeah, yeah you've done enough work to feel good about it and sign off on it. So I thought that was just yeah. like such a different take and way more of like a critical thinking right. approach to it, not a robot going through steps. It's like, we need to critically think about yeah. this company and the balance sheet. I mean, that would just make it so much more fun. It's like, here's the balance sheet and we're just going to dive into how these numbers are made up. And yeah, I think we get too caught up in the checklist of the system. Well, uh, it does, it, does it have that line or it doesn't? So uncheck that box and then it changes the procedures. And you know. I think we're onto something here. Uh, overly processing, pro processizing this stuff has taken the critical thinking out of it and taking critical thinking out of almost anything makes it a lot less fun. Uh, yeah. Makes Through smart fun. people, at least. Mm-hmm. <laughs>
yeah. <laughs> and you want smart people. Right. That's I mean, it. that that's a that's a. I think we just came up with an yeah. epiphany moment. Yeah, this is this is deep. I hope. <laughs> All right. Okay. So maybe one of the ways to get some critical thinking back, hopefully, or so the uh, profession is hoping for, is by switching up the CPA exam. This is cool. And so now there used to be for those who I think everybody listening is probably familiar with the fact that there are four parts of the CPA exam, which has always been FAR, B, C, Reg, and Audit. Uh, B, C is often viewed as one of the easier ones. It's the kind of just overall more business-oriented thing. It's less accounting specific. That's been dropped now. And now you have to take Audit, FAR, and Reg. And then you have the option to choose from one of the three. So your core is of, is accounting, um, you know, financial accounting and reporting, auditing, regulation, and taxation. The new elements are supposed to be kind of more technology oriented, but you have business analysis and reporting, you have tax compliance and planning, and you have information systems and controls. And this is sort of picking a major within the accounting profession and specialization. Yeah. I think it's a cool, I think it's a very cool option because the accountants can go in a lot of different directions once you get the CPA exam. And this sets your course a little clearer and allows you to get like the appropriate knowledge for where you want to go. And I would think after working in audit for a couple of years, you'd have a good sense of like what direction you want to head into. And so you've probably been able to learn enough in the real world and make that pick and then choose this fourth section accordingly. So I guess if we had to offer advice, which I don't, no one's asking me for advice or anything, <laughs> but I would say take the three required sections first as you're working through and learning more about stuff and save that decision of what's the fourth part that I want to take for the the last one. I think you, I think you have to. I don't think you can pick to do one before the other three. That's so it brilliant. works out. That's brilliant. Perfect. Man, they got yeah. really nailed something here. Yeah. And I, I think what's good here too is kind of what we were talking about is I think this creates the the incentive for passion. Before it was just, I just have to do these four parts because I have to do them. Suddenly when it's you have this option, it's now you making an active choice. I'm choosing the tax and compliance because I really want to be the person that people can go to and I just know my tax stuff. And now I'm I'm connected to the thing I'm choosing. It's not just, well, I had to take it because that's what you have to do to get your CPA. Um, I think a lot of people, I think the most popular, if I had to take a prediction, I think the most popular thing is going to be information systems and controls. Anybody that's, I think, getting their CPA is a pretty smart person. And I think they're seeing the writing on the walls that information systems and technology is the future. Um, the people who created the exam, technology is a major component now of this. And that's the one that most closely aligns with it. I would... <clears throat> I would say that it would be one of the smarter career decisions to make would be to focus on the information yeah. systems and controls. Don't, don't, you know, don't sleep on controls. There's always yeah. more regulation. You always have to deal with it. And and that's going to be ongoing work that comes out that, that's just constantly coming out. And it seems like, you know, just pretty, pretty clear career path setting right here. So if I want to become a tax expert and head into that direction and make a ton of money in the future, mm -hmm. when there are no tax people who can provide great strategic tax planning advice, boom, do that one. That's awesome. Business analysis and reporting feels like that's kind of lighting up for that CFO track. If you want to head in that direction, yep. that's the one to do. And then IT systems controls, head into the IT world, do compliance, all that stuff, have great job security. Yeah. This is cool, man. Yeah. I think they shout out to the, yeah. the ICPA. They did a great job. So that starts this year. So, uh, you know, for, for those who haven't gotten their CPA, though, that's a, a, an opportunity to kind of <laughs> pick, to pick your major. But yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think that hopefully this does help with uh, just incentivizing people to go into it. I would love to see... Like let's you let four or five years or whatever play out. I wonder if the scores of the section you get to choose are higher than the scores of all the other ones. Like, is there going to yeah. be some component of like that's what I want to be doing, and as such, people either try self select into something that they understand a little bit more already, or try a little harder than the, during the studying. Yeah. And like, what would the average score per section yeah. be across that? I think you would. I think uh, I definitely think you would. Yeah. When it's a, when it's your choice, yeah, you feel that more b bigger incentive to do it. So uh, other other news that's happening this year beyond the CPA evolution is uh, SPACs are kind of, I've been hearing a lot about SPACs lately and we start, we talked about it a little bit last year and oh my God, well, coming I from the like, not-for-profit world, you know, this was uh, not really the most familiar thing, but coming for you, especially, you know, at a company that is pre-IPO, 40% of SPACs uh, IPOs failed to find a target last year. So I spent the back half of 2020 and all of 2021 on every pre-IPO webinar talking about SPACs. Like I've, I have, I, I've, when, when I saw the slide, I was like, wait, what, what the hell's going on with SPACs again? Are they back in? Yeah. Sure enough, it's probably back in the appropriate context where it's being questioned, right? <laughs> <laughs> whether it's a good idea or not. Um, should I take a second to explain what a SPAC is? Yeah. So you can level, give us a level set on it. I think it's bit. good because I think, uh, yeah, a lot of accounts, we just are stuck in the books, but we don't really see what's yeah, going it's, on. Yeah. It's a, it's a relatively new thing. So what happens is you'll have some 
people. They're generally like executives of some sort of background where they can be impressive people to work with. Maybe they'll, they're, they've been board members or something. Um, and they'll go out and they'll raise a bunch of money from people. So call it 100 million bucks, 200 million bucks, something like that. And they'll create what's called a special purpose acquisition vehicle or the SPAC. So the SPAC is now a company with two employees and 100 million bucks in the bank and nothing else going on. And then they decide they want to IPO. So they go public, right? And there's a structure to it where I believe it is you have however many shares are necessary to make the stock worth $10. So when you go out, it's it's like a $10 per share price. And then the price will move based on the speculation of whether you're going to buy a company or not. So basically what you're doing is you're going public as a really simple entity. So you get to skip all the hard parts about going public. You don't have to be Sarbanes-Oxley compliant. You're not going through a banker thing where you have to do a roadshow and go through all that. You're just like flip the switch and you become a public company because you have nothing going on. Um, and then you go out and you try to find a target to acquire. So it's a special purpose acquisition vehicle. You're going to take your hundred million bucks and go and try to buy a company and really just buy like a percentage of the company and take it public. Mm-hmm. You do this reverse merger thing. And so you end up becoming a public yeah. company through this what in my opinion, what I view as a hack or a loophole right. to make it happen. So what we what what ended up happening was, yeah, so a lot of people were going out. It was like a boom time. And I think what happens behind the scenes, maybe a little speculation here, is like the people who run the SPAC are getting a little bit of a fee to run this thing. So you're you're motivated to go raise some money and, and run a SPAC. Um, but then you have to go out and try to find a target. So like we were being approached by SPACs in 2020 and 2021 asking if we'd be interested in going public via a SPAC vehicle. I, I got like a half a dozen calls yeah. about this. So if I really wanted to go public, we could have flipped the switch and been a public company already. Yeah. But what happens is the general perception is if you go public via a SPAC, you're not that strong of a company. And the reason is because the traditional process for going through going public requires you to build up a book you go, you pitch a bunch of bankers, you pitch a bunch of investors, you get a certain amount of firms to commit to the amount that you're raising. Hopefully you're oversubscribed on the amount you want to raise, which shows signs of you're a really good company. And then when you go public, your stock price is going to pop afterwards, um, kind of by definition. Mm-hmm. Conversely, on a SPAC front, you have no buyers lined up immediately. There's no one who's agreed to hold your stock in the long run, which is part of the discussion with the bankers when you're running the roadshow is a lot of them are pitching like, hey, we're buy and hold buyers. So we'll be on your cap table. We're going to own 5% of your business and we're never going to sell a share of it. And that's really appealing as an executive because that in some ways sets a floor on the price of your stock, right? So right. you want people who are going to hold and have less float that's being traded on a regular basis. Fair. In a SPAC, you got none of that and you just have a bunch of float that's going on out there. So the perception from the investment community is generally this is not as strong of a business because they couldn't get a banker role through a, ro- through a roadshow to build it up. Yeah. Um, and then operationally, they haven't gone through all the rigor that's required to go public. So Sarbanes-Oxley and stuff like that isn't really adhered to really well. So you have this double whammy of like investors don't view it as a really great business. And then internally, it's just going to become a total mess up because of everything that's going on. So Flowcast, we did very well in the SPAC era because we could come in very quickly, help companies get their operations in order, help them get compliant get in Sarbanes-Oxley. So like we sold our software to a lot of SPACs mm. back in the day because they needed it like right. yesterday. You know what I mean? <clears throat> and so it was really good. Uh, but yeah, a bunch of them never ended up finding targets. People were just rolling out SPACs left, right, left, right, and center. Uh, do you know the guy by the name of Tramoth Paliapatia? No. He started like 20 different SPACs <laughs> all in. He's he's uh, He is one of the co-hosts of the All In podcast. Yeah. He, he used to work at Facebook and is like a He's a billionaire now and does all this stuff, but like he, he, man, had a bunch of SPACs lined up during, and I'm, I'm not sure how many of them found targets or not, but certainly not all of them found targets. And I, I think his ticker was even, it was like SPAC A, SPAC B, SPAC C, SPAC D. And then it would get traded on based on the rumors of like, oh, SPAC C is targeting SoFi to take them public during this or whatever. And it would just like trade on yeah. rumor mills and stuff like that. So it's such a weird dynamic. It felt to me like a loophole for going yeah. public and not in the best interest of like really many people around the table. It feels like che- it's like taking steroids. It's like cheating, you know, like you're not actually strong. You just like bolt yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you didn't go. actually yeah. have to like prove, you know, what you're doing and go through the grind of like becoming profitable and the exercise of how you deal with all the compliance stuff. It was just you skipped all the training and were put into the pros. And now all of a sudden you're like out there and you're like, oh, I've never even touched a soccer ball before. And now I'm like uh, the starting yeah. forward. Skip, <laughs> skip leg day and all that kind yeah. of stuff. So yeah, it's uh, not, 
I'm glad it's being uh, looked into a little Why more. do so many celebs get in on them? Because that was a, that, a big trend too. Like a lot of celebrities. I I think celebrities. Some financial advisor. Celebrities can be, be convinced to do stuff. Why, yeah. why did so many? Uh, well, I think first of all, venture capital got pretty popular, right? It got yep. to be like a hot space. So you saw a bunch of celebrities like even Ashton Kutcher, for mm-hmm. example, Kim Kardashian, right? Like starting their own venture funds or being heavily involved in them. So I think it got trendy. It got known as a way to make like a good amount of money. And then that probably expanded into SPACs. And, but at the end of the day, also, it's like um, they were probably getting paid, quite frankly, yeah. because the motivation is if you're running a SPAC, you want to do everything in your power to be able to convince a CEO to go public via your SPAC. Yeah. And so if you have celebrities around the table, let's say we were a consumer brand, mm. they could go to the table and be like, hey, you sell, you know, whatever you run, some consumer brand, you sell lipstick. Uh, Kim Kardashian's part of our SPAC group. You will get free publicity from her after you start working with us. So that becomes appealing as a mm-hmm. CEO. Like, oh, you could actually drive value for us. Whereas if you're just a couple of bankers who won't really drive a ton of value for the company, like, why would I choose this one over this one? So trying to find a yeah. differentiator um, was probably a it's, good. It's wild that these basically are just they're they're kind of like shit meme stocks in a in a, in a sense because it's all just based on hype. It's all just entirely speculation of like we might buy a company and maybe and a lot of the stuff that i think has been bought in the last couple years has been very futuristic oriented because there is that concern about profitability but some of these things are like we're gonna we're gonna be an apartment complex on mars you know like and that's what people are investing in that i i i I could go off for a while about how how people think you're on the adam newman uh train again (laughs) (laughs) former we work now something else yeah it's these some of these things that they don't seem like they ever have a foreseeable business model that will drive revenue in the future if for generations it's, it feels like i mean a granted time moves you know technology moves quickly innovation happens quickly but um i don't know like if i invest in one of these things now will i ever see a return in my lifetime of the profitability of the the storage units on mars like i don't think i don't know but so the sec adopting to to to, to alleviate some of the concerns around this because i think these are a uh, this is a loophole that needs to be closed. SEC adopting new rules on SPACs in 2024, um, because like you said, SPACs don't need the same SOX compliance because mm-hmm. um, they're kind of go- scooting around that, but it will now mandate new disclosure requirements in SPAC IPOs and DSPAC business combinations regarding the sponsor of the SPAC, potential conflicts of interest and dilution of shareholder interest. It's always very favorable to the people who create it, less so to the people who now buy this speculative stock when it hits the, the market and they're kind of seeing yeah. the people who created it get their fun. It's kind of a take from the poor and give to the rich. Uh, requiring the target company in a DSPAC transaction to be a co-registrant with the SPAC or another shell company and therefore assume responsibility together with the target's directors and officers required to sign a registration statement. And then uh, aligning just more closely with the financial statement requirements in a business combination transaction involving a SPAC and a target company with those of a traditional IPO. So it's it's kind of saying, okay, look, if the purpose of these things is to take a company that would have would typically have to have all of these regulations in place. So if that's your plan, then you're going to have to kind of do something like that too. Yeah, and I, I, I of course come from the cynical aspect where it's just a way to hack hack around the yeah. IPO process. But I do wonder if it, what is the innocent good example where this is a useful vehicle like there. So someone had to make a pitch that had some good sound at some point in the past. Maybe maybe I'm dead wrong and being a little naive. Here, I would but love I would love to know. know what's what's the real use case where this makes objective sense for all parties involved. Like yeah. what was the, what was the original logic? I think this? that'll be something to look into after the show. See if I could find. Uh, when when has a spec been a, a, a good thing? <laughs> is there a good use of? A is there a good use of a spec? <laughs> let's let's uh, ask ChatGPT yeah. that. So I want to move on to this section: bullish or bearish, and this is sort of. Going through a bunch of hot topics for 2024. Are we predictive it's something we think is going to be a big, uh, you know, a big win or a total flop? And um, so I got a little, our little bear, our little bull on there. And let's uh, tackle some of these things that we've got on here. So uh, first thing, we got the the New York Stock Exchange, the U.S. economy. Did we nail the soft landing? <laughs> the, the IPO window, you know, will 2024 be a favorable year for companies looking to go public? You bullish on, on yeah. that potential? I mean, seems like seems like we've gotten accomplished the soft landing somehow uh definitely remains to be seen if we actually cut interest rates or not i think that would be the ultimate indicator of did we achieve a soft soft landing um but you know stock market already reacted to the 
decision, the potential of cutting interest rates. And so if that doesn't happen, then presumably there's going to be a downturn mm-hmm. in the market after that. Um, if it does, you know, it's probably not going to be as much of a pop as you would expect because it's already baked into the market. So um, I don't know how much like the NYSE is going to rip this year un- unless there's something done above and beyond what was already sure. discussed by the Fed, which, hey, I would love that. Selfishly, I would love for uh, a big, big bull run to happen. And I think the one to really look at is what's going to happen with the IPO, the IPO backlog. Yeah. Right? That's really itch because you have, there are dozens and dozens of great companies in the IPO backlog who are just waiting for the right time to do it. And what's been really nice is a lot of those great companies have really cleaned up operations and got more profitable. So they don't have to go public and mm-hmm. founders are, are and uh, investors aren't clamoring for quite as much liquidity as they have in the past. So they're like able to be a little bit more patient. I think that patience might be running out yeah. here. Uh, so this could be the year where everyone starts to, you know, a lot of companies start to go. Um, and there should be some really fun, yeah. fun names that go that go public. And that sure. could be a good thing, I think, just for the overall economy. Is just when when you see good things happening, and there's this there's this notion that we live in a vibe economy now. I don't know if you've heard about this. <laughs> I have not. Um, I I kind of have pulled that. I, I might have just created that term from pulling from a few different <laughs> sources, but I'm coining it uh, the vibe economy, which is the economy is very much so dictated, and the market is very so dictated based on like how people are just feeling emotionally. It's it's. It's like, well, the vibes are kind of good right now. And when, you know, when you didn't have to pay a lot at the gas pump, the vibes are good. Mm-hmm. So you're like, all right, I'll, uh, you know, I'm feeling pretty good. I can go out that night and, and you know, go get a dinner because I didn't have to pay as much this week for groceries or, or at the pump. And then that kind of drives the business and people are like, oh, wow, the kind of bars are popping right now. People are out and about and that gives people. So, you know, <laughs> so it's very much so I think we live in a vibe economy. And I think I, if we see some companies IPO and they're successful, it will bring the vibes up. I think, I think, I mean, I think you're right. I, I think it's a, a newer branding term for it, but something that's been very real for for a while. Like when um, you know, you in, you interview people about their for the for political campaigns generally, it's like interviewing people about how they feel about the economy. It's not you know you ask people how they feel. It's not about yeah. You know, have you looked at unemployment rates recently and you know com- like paired that with GDP growth and stock market growth and how does all that? It's like now how do you feel about it? And it's generally rather simple. It's like, oh, milk and eggs are more expensive and gas is really expensive, so I don't feel good about it. Or I lost my job and I don't feel good about it. It's not about, it's very local and personal to them. Yeah. And that does drive a lot of decisions and the vibe The vibe gets going around there. But I, I think talking about the economy is like a really nuanced topic, yeah. right? And the stock market is only applicable to a certain amount of people. There are like a large swath of Americans who could not care less about the stock market because they own no stock. It's, mm-hmm. it's just like whatever. Um, one of my favorite news anchors, she calls, she calls the stock market, the chart of rich people's feelings. <laughs> so, <laughs> <That's very true. laughs> so I think that's the vibe check that you're looking yeah. for. So the, the chart of rich people's feelings and that res- that's like based on interest rates and speculation and how, you know, high, like high level monetary stuff that's occurring. Yeah. Whereas people who are going to vote and, you know, and, and like make decisions that are local and they care more about things like milk and gas and eggs. Uh, things that perhaps the people who care about the stock market like don't even know how much those things cost because it's so below their pay grade. Right. So, so there's just a, this total contrast in what people care about in the economy. And it's like for people who own stock, I feel like there's like this big, it's easy to forget about what matters in the economy for yeah. the vast majority of our population. That's true. That's a good point. Yeah. So the second thing we have on this list is uh, welcome back, return to the office. Will companies continue their push and will it be successful? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm curious. I've, I'll, I'll give you my my take on it. Yeah. I've spoken with a few CEOs who have done the mandate approach, and it has not gone well. It, mm. it doesn't it doesn't go well. There's you know it's not well received, obviously. Um, and then people quit. And then furthermore, a lot of people just don't listen and don't adhere to it. And it's like sure. fire me, sure. Yeah, how do you <laughs> call? Listen? I'm gonna call your bluff. <laughs> and so it's like ah, that's not a healthy like environment to to work into. So I think there's going to be a lot more you know encouraging of people to come back in the office. Perhaps a shift in hiring strategy where, like at Flowcast, we're going to do this. We have we have an office in LA. It's great. I want to hire. Just have a bigger focus on hiring in LA again to get the office built up. We'll still hire remote, but I've I've asked our recruiting team to spend thirty percent of their time on the LA area, sure, which is a very different approach yeah. from what we've had historically. And I'd love to get more salespeople in the office, get more customer people in the office. Right. I'm excited to get studios yeah. in the office and just get get a better vibe going on and get everyone in. And I think. Um, when people are back to it, they'll realize that like, it is nice to be around people, but your five days a week is a tough thing to pull off, sure. you know, so we'll be more flexible about it. Hopefully it's a few days a week, but the the real goal is to like, you know, I hope that people want to come into the right. office and I 
don't really want to force people who don't want to be in the office to come in. And so I think a bit of it is also personality sure. dependent. Because yeah, you see some people are extroverts and love being around people. Some people are introverts and don't like being around people. And it's about, yeah, making sure it's a good place for people to, to yeah. work. Because I go back to like the whole efficiency argument. I I don't, to me at the end of the day, it comes down to the person. Mm -hmm. It's like to suggest that if I'm not going to commute, that means I'm more productive what you're saying is okay. So all those commuting hours, you're going to spend working instead, right. and, and really you're not just lying in bed. <laughs> you're not distracted at home at all. There's a, you're really right. working heads down for eight hours a day. Yeah. And then conversely, when people come to the office, they're not working for eight hours a day. You're socializing. Yeah. You're talking to other people. It's like there's like there's there's time where you're not working either. So neither one is like as perfect or utopian as yep. anyone makes it seem. There's gray area. And I feel like people can be productive in either setting. It's just a matter of like what makes sense for your personality. So as long as you're hiring smart, hardworking people, like you, it doesn't really matter. But having a good office vibe to encourage more people to come in and have a better time builds better culture, gives better bonds and is, is a good thing. I think setting expectations from the beginning is one of the key elements there. So part of the hiring strategy is what I think, that's what I think companies should move to is well, if you just hire the person as a hybrid worker where it's like, yeah, we, we work two or three days from the office, then the expectation is just set. I'm applying to a job knowing what it's going to be. Yep. Right now, it's a tough situation because everybody was told, up, oh, you're remote, and, you know, and now you're trying to retract back on that. That's a tough thing to do. But if from the yep. from the get-go, it was something that was kind of set in place. It's a little bit easier. So the interesting thing, though, about this is remote workers were hit the hardest by layoffs Data shows that fully remote employees were more likely to be laid off last year than their peers who put in office time. They're also more likely to quit. And I think that's just the matter of it, it's you could be equally productive, I think, uh, depending on the person at home or in the office. But the culture and the camaraderie and the connection that you feel to the people who you work with, it's easy to to, to lay off somebody who you've never seen in person before. Yeah. It's easy to quit a job where you've never met anybody and you have no tie to anybody at the company. But when these are people who kind of become like your family because you're spending a lot of your time with them, there's a different bond that forms and I think it just makes you a stronger unit as a company as well. Yeah, I think that's the reality of, yeah. reality of business as well. You know, a lot of people would, a lot of people would hear what you say, what you just said, and I, I agree with you. Uh, a lot of people will hear that and say like, well, it should all be merit-based and it's only on who's performing the best and all this stuff. And it's like, I don't know, when it's when performance yeah. is pretty close, then it's going to be all about the who, who do you have the better connection yeah. with and that's the reality of business and right. might as well just accept it. It's not quite as fair as everyone wants it to be. And so if you're, if you're remote, you're, you are behind the eight ball in many regards, if there's a part of your company that's yeah. going into the office. Uh, back to the vibe economy aspect yep. is, you know, you can't take, <laughs> I, you can have logic and stats and numbers all you want, which are those metrics and those KPIs, but there's, we're human beings. We have an emotional component to it and you yep. can't ignore that. That's, that's, you have to factor that into your logic. So, um, the next part about, uh, technology here is wearable AI like the Apple Vision Pro. Is there actually a use case for it? Or, you know, is this going to be the year it, it takes off? Or is this just another thing that's a little ahead of its time? I was, read, I was reading an article about it this morning. Some guy who did a review mm. of it. And um, so apparently they're 3,500 bucks yeah. for starters. Yeah. Okay, well, that's going to be limiting in how, how popular They're it only selling, it. I think, 100,000. That's, gosh. In okay. the first year. <clears throat> wow. Um, I've seen, the th I don't know, I wouldn't wear it. I wouldn't put that thing on my head, like for any like period of time, not my thing. It makes sense though. They seem to like the whole being able to interact with the real world and have augmented reality over the top of it is, does seem like a cool thing. And the commercial is really good, really yeah. well done, great marketing on their front. But then the, the practical side of me is just like, am I going to sit with that thing on my head? How long am I going to use it? And I just feel like it's something where you might buy it and get really bored with it. Yeah. And it's going to ultimately end up collecting dust somewhere and you spend, yeah. uh, over three thousand dollars on this thing. I will not be in the early adopters uh, grouping of this. I, I will no. see if people find a use case for this where it's actually making their life somewhat better, and go from there. I don't like this, man. Also, just to throw that out there, like the like Google Glass, right, was the last version of this that came out. And, and whenever I saw someone with a Google Glass on, it's just like, wait, are they like scanning my face and all this mm. information's up in front? It's just like you, you get the. It's like a very sci-fi yeah. feeling. And so if someone came out to talk to me wearing one of these things, I would not, I would just not be a fan of that. Right. Like I wouldn't want to interact with that person. You, you so what's the social to stigma going to be? And they just walk up to you. You can't see their face at all. And they're just like, oh, what's going on, dude? And it looks like they're in a space. I mean, the, that's the- Part in the Martian. Like the in the commercial, you know, like the the dad's wearing it, then all of a sudden he's like interacting with his kids. Yeah. But the thing's still on and it's like, that's weird. Yeah. That's just really weird. Here's, so, a, here's a content pitch. Maybe I'll make a video of this. Looking 
the, the people on the other side, <laughs> what they're looking at is this person is like, what are you talking about? There's a dinosaur behind me. Like, that, could be, that could be really funny. <laughs> it's funny. It's like, I'm looking at this person who's apparently looking at me, but I cannot see where their eyes are whatsoever. Yeah, who's this? Who's this? Like Damien Tomlinson's like head mask. Um, uh, so, okay. Anyway, moving on from, uh, from, from that. Will ChatGBT keep growing and maintain being the OG of AI, or do you think the you'll have some upheaval from competitors now because everybody's getting into this space? And obviously, they're the original; they were first. They had turbulent times, um, but where are we at now? Yeah, well, they're probably at the point where they've built up enough brand loyalty to where they'll they'll do just fine, regardless of what I think is going to happen. Which is this stuff's going to be cheaper. It's mm-hmm. it's going to get faster. It's going to get cheaper. It's going to be open sourced. LLMs are going to become way more available. But I think at this point, ChatGPT has enough users and enough of a brand where people think it's really cool and know how to use it to where they'll be just fine as a business. I'm, I don't have concerns over OpenAI as a, a company and how they're going to do. Um, but no, there's going to be more options out there and more things for people to build with. And we're already seeing it develop. You know, our our AI team internally, yep. is, there's new LLMs coming, over, like coming out all the time. And so they're leveraging more and more stuff. Yep. And so, yeah, I think it's going to get commoditized. But in a world of commodities is where brand wins. Yep. Right. And they have a they have a great brand. Yeah. I love it. The OGs, right? Yeah. What do you what do you think? What have you what are you seeing? Do you use ChatGPT? I use ChatGPT. How, how I, frequent is it like a daily thing for you? Uh no, it's like a once a week. It's it's usually sp- project specific. Is mm-hmm. uh, if I'm like I I need some ideas for an outline for for this, or if I'm looking for some like quick fact like some facts or some information, um, based on if you know, if even if there's a video idea where it's like oh I want to know, see you know, 10, you know, even if an accounting thing is like, what's the biggest, most, you know, 10 impactful accounting regulation changes in the last century. Yeah. You can kind of, you could just ask that as opposed to Googling it and having to go search for it and try to find it. Nobody knows the stuff off the top of their head. So it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a more efficient way of, of Googling stuff. So you're in a, a bit of a brainstorming and, and yeah. Google replacement kind of usage. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's roughly where I'm at. Yeah. yeah. I think that's where probably most people will, will be and will get to. Um, there's still plenty of people that haven't even touched it before. I haven't heard of it. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, wait, what? My Al? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So speaking of, uh, of more tech stuff, well, let's talk about TikTok real quick. Become uh, oversaturated. Is it worth it for businesses or even vind- individuals to use it anymore? And they're also changing uh, the algo also on privacy concerns. And, you know, it's kind of costly. It's a little ineffective. Will they ever get out of this storm of being able to breach this United States compliance issue or I I'll give my hot take on TikTok since this is the content realm I'm in I I think it's totally oversaturated at this point I have friends who are creators across the board everybody's seeing just declining um metrics in general mm. there's too much stuff out there it favors the top one percent of the people who are creators on on it but for everybody else there's just too much stuff where it can't it, it, there's too much content for even a one person to view. So even people who follow you, they follow so many people, they could spend an entire day scrolling on TikTok and never come across your video because there's just that much stuff out there. And wow. I think it's okay. I think it's decreased the quality. Um, I think businesses are realizing it's not converting. It's really tough to get people from TikTok onto other platforms where you can actually monetize. And I think TikTok's you know pivot has been this uh, store. They're trying to basically be like an Amazon where you can be on TikTok looking at products that creators are endorsing and then buy the product right there from the marketplace within the app itself. So that's their their effort. But I think as soon as you move away from that content model, which was your core to get you going in the first place and you move to that sort of different monetization thing, I think it starts to, the quality sort of just starts to lag. And isn't, so I haven't used I don't use TikTok, yeah. you'll have to excuse me, but I, I am an old guy with Instagram, so yeah. Reels is similar, right? So you yeah. just end up scrolling through that stuff. And isn't that kind of, you know, they're, first and foremost, they're in the attention economy, right? So they want as much of your attention as yeah. humanly possible. And isn't the brainless scroll or just flipping right. nonstop? And what is it on TikTok? You got like two seconds to get someone's attention. Yeah. So they're going to flip to the next video. It's with all of it, yeah. So if you, if someone's flipping... And then they're like, oh, I want to buy that. And they click on a link and they go to buy something. Do you then lose their attention? Yeah. I mean, I is th- that is that in the best interest of your app? I, I don't think so. Because but I think I think once you buy something, it's kind of like a closed loop. And then it's like, do you keep, I don't know. If, I don't know about it. Maybe it's the accountant in me that's like, I don't like to buy stuff in general. But, <laughs> but <laughs> that's I, a different topic. But yeah. like once I buy something, I like, all right, close my laptop. I bought the thing I needed to buy. I'm, I'm 
kind of feel like I need to move on to the next yeah. activity. I'm not going to go back onto the app and scroll some more and then buy something I, else. I could be dead wrong. Maybe people are addicted enough to where they'll they'll slap their credit card down, buy something, yeah. and then head right back over to TikTok and start scrolling again. Perhaps, perhaps I'm wrong. Um, but that, that's, that is really interesting to me that it actually took this long to get saturated. Yeah. Like they, I mean, they blew up. Wasn't it the fastest growing social yeah. media app of all time? That's why everybody got on it. Okay. And, and here so it was more, more consumers than producers. Like, like if, if you're saying there wasn't content saturation, then that means the vast majority of the early users were all just consumers of the content that was being produced. What happened was it, it, it was both kind of growing at the same pace, but then the algorithm incentivized you to post more. Because oh, the more ooh. stuff they were just building inventory, and there was still plenty of inventory already oh, on so there. By more stuff, you mean both people and the amount of content. Yeah. So creators were be if you want to be a creator on TikTok, you have to post multiple times a day, and you have to post every single day, and you have to do it. So it just became flooded and flooded. But the problem is the quality of the content started going down. But at yeah. the time, everybody who was posting anything was getting thousands of views, and then hundreds of thousands of views, and then millions of views, and so people were like, just post, 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 post. But eventually, over time everybody and their mother who got onto TikTok started making TikTok videos and now a million people are doing the same trend. You can't find the one good one anymore. And it becomes very difficult to kind of filter, which is why I do, I, th I think Instagram, it, it gives the appeal of like, it's a more valuable area. So people are less incentivized to post a bad piece of content there. Mm -hmm. There's a little more pride. You're not just going to post some some nonsense of you rambling about something you're gonna be like no i want this to be a little more curated a better piece of edited content well you're you're creating content for an audience that you that has chosen to follow you rather than producing content for an algorithm that's going to end up sure. in front of some random person that has not chosen to follow your yeah. your content so that yeah that does seem like a very different audience and yeah. different approach to yeah. the content and they, and they are they have come closer together but even just the perception that the consumer market has on these two apps and, and, you know, my roommate's a prime example is he'll be like, I'll test something out on TikTok and see how it does. And if it does like decent over there, then I'll be like, okay, this is good. Now I'll throw it onto Instagram. Oh, and it's kind of like a trial run. So it's not even, even that's somebody who's a full-time creator job is, is to test it using TikTok as a testing area. And I do the same thing. I don't, I don't really use TikTok at all at all it, much. It's just, I'll throw it on there, see how it does. If it does good, great. If it doesn't, whatever. But I'd really more so focus on the Instagram stuff. So hmm. I, I am excited, though, that the algorithm uh, on Instagram is going to lean towards qual quality over quantity. Okay. Just because with how much stuff's out there, there's enough people who are creators. You don't need people to flood with content. I'd rather just have good stuff be on there so everything I see is good and it's not just a gimmick. I would rather like ding people for producing too much. We were, yeah. we're also, we were talking about Mr. Beast before we yeah. started on this one as well. And he's absolutely like a quality over quantity guy, right? Was is, yeah. Does he spend a million, a million yeah. bucks per video yeah. is what you're saying? So, and what is it, a weekly cadence? I think he does. Like a video a week? I think he does weekly. Yeah. Which would not fly on TikTok, but does incredibly well on YouTube. Yeah. Like, Quarter billion They're longer dollars, videos. But, People uh, watch the whole thing. It's watching a show. You're a watching a fully produced followers. show. He has a quarter billion yeah. followers. It's nuts. Yep. Crazy. Um, so, I'm, I'm bearish on TikTok. There you go. Yeah. Bearish my, on TikTok as well. TikTok. Uh, so tech giants, are they about to have a great year on the up or is the tech boom over? So there's a whole, there's a whole bunch of stuff here. Um, it, you know, so sort of sub discussion was, the, you know, layoffs are common uh, year over year at the industry in January. It seems that there's always a lot of that. But uh, interestingly enough, Discord, Instagram, Google, Trend Micro have laid off 7,500 people so far. Um, if this pace continues, then the sector loses around 200,000 jobs on the year, which is still an improvement from last year's 262,000. Is this just companies that kind of boomed, like the tech boom, leaning up a little bit and kind of like truing up to size? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is another one where two separate economies, right? The people getting laid off aren't going to appreciate this, but the stock market's very much going to appreciate it. That's that's it. It's not like it's a... I think for a lot of these companies, it's not, oh my God, we need to do this to like survive as a business and extend our... It's not like startup land where it's sure. like, oh God, we got to extend runway. And then this is the, the, this is like, how do we optimize profitability and yeah. jack up you know, earnings, EBITDA, our old yeah. EBITDA and earnings per share and all that good stuff. Um, so it's not... Yeah, this is one where like it'll be great for the stock market, yeah. but not not good for. It. That's yeah. a really being like a a really sort of good insight on that is it's the layoffs don't mean this business is struggling. It just means they're becoming more efficient. Not at all. Case. It's it's shedding fat. Yep. And not to say any of people are not worth you know having, but sometimes there's just not a job for you to do, and it's it's you not can't get paid to do. Yeah, that. oftentimes it's not it's not about the person. It's about the org chart. Yeah, 
And I think a lot of it, the, this is this is super interesting. So particularly within tech, you know, a lot of this is happening within tech. You hire a lot of really ambitious people into the space and they want to get promoted a lot. And what ends up happening is when you promote somebody, you know, you got to give them direct reports. Yeah. And so you end up with a really bloated middle management layer like really quickly. And that's where a lot of these companies are making cuts from is it's from the manager who's overseeing three people. Right. It's like, well, why do I need two managers overseeing three people each when the span of control for a manager is seven? Right. Like it should be seven. And yeah. so just within that one example, economies I can, of scale. I can cut one of these managers. And then at scale, when you're talking about, you know, 10,000 individual contributors that are being managed by, in an extreme case, let's say 3,000 managers, well, really, I only need 1,200 managers. Right. So we're going to cut 1,800 managers here and not lose productivity. Yeah. That kind of start, that like starts to become a right. really easy conversation when you're not as concerned about like appeasing up and comers and head taking, right. accepting promotions all the time and everything like that. So yeah, I think we're in a little bit of a new, a new world here where like the promotion paths of the past have actually set the stage for some of these yeah, challenges, which is a really interesting cycle that's been, that's been created here. So, right. There's a I difference know. between a, a manager whose job is just managing people and managing the team. And then in these cases, you kind of need to be a manager that's doing stuff as well, but that retracts from your ability to do that as well as the people underneath you. So yeah, like if, you know, if I'm at a company, I, if, if I'm someone who's getting a bunch of stuff done as an individual contributor, I'm a whole lot less worried about being laid off yeah. than as a manager who's maybe isn't doing as much stuff. And, you know, if, if that holds true, if you believe in that as a business owner, then Aren't you in some ways saying that individual contributors are more valuable than managers and perhaps compensate, mm. compensation should be thought about that way? I, that's my whole, the entrepreneur, the technician and the manager uh, employer. And I, like I said, I think three tracks. Yep. That's, there you go. That's, you know, talk about new year's resolutions is like, let's, let's get this, uh, let's, let's broadcast this to the world. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start making white papers about this. <laughs> <laughs> People who get shit done should be compensated. Yes. To say, well, yep. The individual totally contributor agree. value. Yep. Uh, so last three things, these are kind of on the more fun side. Race to space. Is it a waste? <laughs> <laughs> um, so who's, who's racing here? <laughs> NASA versus SpaceX. I mean, I think I think well, NASA basically just is a supporting arm for SpaceX yes. at this point. Yes. Um, SpaceX has won this one. It, it's just the, space has been in the news a lot. There's been more rocket ships getting launched over the last couple of years than you know. We had a, a lull period where we just stopped. The Cold War ended and we just stopped ex space exploration. Now it's like the hot ticket market. Everybody's trying to do that. Is that because they're predicting, you know, apocalyptic world and it's like, we got to go find another planet to inhabit or whatever it is. But is this, is this where we sh should be spending billions and billions <laughs> of dollars on, uh, on space? <laughs> I don't, I don't think, I don't think so. Uh, okay. There are a couple, I'll, I'll say there are a couple areas where it's probably worth, worth the investment. So just for like a joy ride to the moon, probably not for Jeff Bezos to have a joy ride to you know, just escape velocity and barely to hovering in space and coming yeah. back down. That's not a good use of resources and everything. One of the things SpaceX is talking about doing is actually helping with global transport. So this is, this is pretty fascinating. Instead of having to put stuff on a ship in China and send it to the United States, which takes, I don't know, a really long time to make mm -hmm. that happen. You obviously burn a lot of uh, fuel along the way. Apparently SpaceX plan is to just go up into space with that stuff, land it in the United States and have it there in a shorter period of time with using less energy and not being worried about, is this waterway blocked because there's a war yeah. going on or is there a storm that's going to stop the ship or did pirates just take over the ship and go like transportation through space. That's a really, and, and obviously you're not going to deep space and doing that, but you're, you're exiting the, or, you know, and you're going around and you're coming back down and that's a big part of why SpaceX's thing is they can land rockets. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like that's, that's their difference is they can land rockets, whereas NASA just has stuff falling into the ocean after right. it's done or, or is leaving it, whatever. So I find that to be a really interesting one. The other one is, uh, are there mining opportunities on asteroids or other mm -hmm. planets where they might have really valuable minerals that we need to continue our way of life sure. as humans on Earth? Which that's one where it's like, you know, stuff like coltan, which we need for batteries. And there are all these other various minerals that are, we're going to deplete them eventually. If you find some asteroid that has a billion years worth of life of these minerals on it that we need, like that's going to be a really good find and someone's going to make a lot of money, a lot of money off of that. So I think those are two interesting use cases, but in terms of like, should we go to Mars and set up a colony in case there's apocalyptic thing? It's like, 
that feels a whole lot more apocalyptic yeah. than something bad going on in, on Earth. Right. <laughs> I don't know, man. Like going to Mars, that's a whole lot worse. So that whole thing, I'm not really into it, but it yeah. does actually feel like there are some interesting like commercial applications yeah. for some of the technology. I mean, hey, we're always looking for places to store stuff. Like, why not store it in orbit, right? It's not a bad. It's not a bad idea. I hate to say it, but yeah, is there a world where we're just just shipping our trash off into space and <laughs> just like dump? Yeah, I think there's like an economic <laughs> thing too. I think it's apparently it's expensive to do that because I think we we do it every once in a while where we just shoot our trash to the sun or For real? something like that. Oh but I think apparently like it's very expensive to do so, and it's the the cost benefit doesn't necessarily weigh out. But the energy part is what I'd be most concerned about. Is like it's a lot of energy to get up to space. And so, and, and also to carry like a truckload of cars, like a shipload worth of cars and get them from China or Japan where they're being made and bringing them to the United States is is a bit of a yeah, that's, heavy load that is, that is to, right. to bring to space. So I was almost thinking you were gonna go with this is like we're actually gonna tell, <laughs> I wouldn't put this past Elon. He's gonna start to build, um, manufacturing plants in space that we, we manufacture it up there and we just send it down to the the countries that you know are looking for it. that's kind of interesting now now how would the tax credits work here with the evs with the parts being manufactured not foreign but you know international <laughs> yeah the, uh, the, maybe the government started putting in things around in the entire universe in the, the universe the, right uh, this yeah, must be produced on american houses. soil or could it be in american space mm -hmm. yeah american <laughs> space uh okay so uh this is one. This is one for myself. Uh, bullish or bearish pickleball. I'm thinking. I mean, it's already on the way up, and I think it's going to keep going up. I mean, I think this All is. Right. We've got Major League Pickleball League, which merged with the United Pickleball Association, whatever. The, yeah, M MLP and UPA. There was like a merger with that too. So you know, you have official teams that yeah. exist that are sponsored, that are owned by professional athletes. A lot of them, and uh, the Orlando Squeeze is owned by the owners of the Orlando Magic. So there's kind of some crossover between basketball now and the pickleball realm, and I think they have the facilities, they have the branding and marketing, and I think it's, it's on the way up. There is a great 30 for 30 on the Orlando Magic getting created and how okay. they got that franchise That's in cool. Orlando, because objectively, when you look at the demographics of Orlando, it makes zero sense that they have an NBA team. Mm. It's like their population at the time was like a quarter million people. Wow. It's, it's like that does not justify a team. So wow. anyway, uh, how, how the guy hacked his way into it and everything, I highly recommend cool. uh, checking that out. That's a really good one. Um, I don't know much about pickleball, yeah. man. So I'll take your, yeah. I'll take your, I'll take your word for it. I guess my big question is, where can I watch pickleball now? So a lot of the times it will be on wherever you'd watch tennis, and they'll just have that okay. on as an alternative. So I've been on an airplane before, and there's not a major tennis tournament going on. They'll they'll be showing pickleball tournaments. Um, okay, so that's a thing too. Cool. And it's I, not just like live streaming yeah. on YouTube. There's it's being picked up. And yeah, getting it is getting picked up. I've, okay. I've seen it on TVs at bars now. Once in a while, it's just one of those things that you know it's kind of on ESPN late night or something like that. Um, and I do think there's an opportunity just uh, on the business world side of things. Golf, as you know, it can be very frustrating and difficult to pick up for, for the, you know, yep. people slamming their clubs into the ground when they shank a shot. Pickleball is a lot more forgiving. And and there's a camaraderie element to you still get four people and you go out and you do something and it's a little easier to pick up. A better workout. Uh, it is a good workout. And I think that there will be incentives and there's a lot of individuals who, you know, the deals are made on the green and there's also going to be deals made on the courts and i could very much see that yeah i could see that being a thing too so um looking to grow your business get into pickleball there you go uh final thing here personal motivation aside sh should baseball do something about these deferred compensation plans <laughs> everyone can do them every franchise is allowed to offer what them. if every team in? kept their cap down by just deferring players payments till after they retire all right i want to give a little uh, i want to defend the, i'm going to defend the dodgers here okay. for a second so the the headlines around it look really bad right 70 million a year 68 million deferred he's making two million bucks a year or whatever um however from a luxury tax perspective and a cash flow perspective it's not nearly as advantageous as it appears so um because that because that's paid out so far in the future, if you inflation adjust it, you bring it back, it's really worth 50 million bucks a year mm -hmm. as of today. So if you just signed a contract today that was normal, like here's how much you're going to make for the next 10 years, no deferred payments at all, it's $50 million a year. So it's a 10-year, it's a $500 million contract. Uh, the way it's structured results in the hit to the luxury tax is $47 million. So the luxury tax threshold in baseball is what determines what, um, so you're able to go up to, it's like $210 million or something like that before you hit this luxury tax, at which case you pay, at which point you pay a penalty for the additional amount you go above it. So taxing the teams that are, that are spending a ton of money, thereby punishing them. 
So it still counts to 47 million towards our luxury tax threshold. So it's not like some massive savings that we got. It's not 2 million bucks. It's mm-hmm. 47 million bucks. And then according to the rules of the union, by the beginning of the third year, the Dodgers need to begin putting enough cash into a trust so that they're able to pay mm-hmm. the deferred compensation on the back end. So then from a cash flow perspective now, you're putting away, you're socking away 50 million bucks a year. You're going to then get interest or, you know, it's going to gain over time and they're, therefore you're able to pay off the deferred amount in the back end. So it's like, uh, okay, okay benefit on the luxury tax. You get to defer putting cash out there for a couple of years, but by the third year, you have to start putting cash away. That So it's still hitting your free cash flow. It's still hitting your luxury tax. And just on headline, like 70 million versus all that seemed yep. ridiculous. But the reason 70 was the number is because it's what is 70 million bucks going to be worth right. in, in you know 10 years or whatever. So the headlines made it look awful, awful. Flowcast did a great blog sure. post around yeah. the dynamics of it. And so when you think about both of those considerations, yeah. it really wasn't like as egregious. So is the, people make it out to seem. Is the, is the, the luxury tax on the, is that the total contract value ba- that that's being based off of, or is it based on like how much from a straight line method, just for example, on in the year that the player's playing? That no. So lu- luxury tax is the, the team's salary cost. Yeah. So when you look at the Dodgers, we have a lot of high paid. Yes. Players. We have Shohei Otani, Mookie Betts, Freddie Freeman, like hopefully Clayton Kershaw coming yeah. back. Now we have Tyler Glass. Now you got a bunch of guys who are making a ton of money. We can spend up to two, I think the number is 208 million a year. So you can spend up to $208 million a year. And then when you go above that, there's like a 50% tax charged by MLB for every amount you pay on top of that. So it's supposed to discourage you from spending more money. But there's some owners who just do not care yeah. about that. And so the Dodgers are, what the Dodgers have been doing is they've been a little more conservative over the last couple of off seasons relative to what they could have spent because they've been waiting for this moment mm-hmm. for like four years. They've been waiting to sign Shohei for the yeah. better part. It, it's like they've been recruiting him since he was still in Japan and missed out on him. And so they, they've wanted him for a long time. Uh, Steve Cohen, the owner of the Mets, who is in the new, uh, the Netflix Dumb Money, of yes, GameStop that yes. came out. I highly recommend that. I did I'm about that. halfway through I it. Do, it's, it's I do love fun. Dumb Money. Watch Dude, that. Dumb Money is like a, it's like a time capsule. Yeah. 2020, you see the, the it's, guy. Uh, yeah, it's right. amazing. Highly recommend it. It's really good. Um, great cast, great cast in there too. So Steve Cohen is famous for just like not caring about that at all because he has more money than he knows what to do with. And he's a childhood fan of the Mets and just like, imagine, you know, imagine if you had $10 billion and you could just buy your favorite sports franchise yeah. and you're like, no, we're going to go win a championship. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm going to spend however much money it takes. That was Steve Cohen. So like the other owners were going to put in a rule specifically about Steve Cohen around the luxury tax yeah. to like, and it was informally known as the Cohen, the Cohen rule. Um, but anyway, so the Dodge, so it's all your player's salary that count towards the luxury tax. And so one of the gripes was like, wait, so that should be a $70 million hit to the Dodgers luxury tax, but it's only $2 million because that's what they're paying per year. But that's the simplest way of looking at it. There's this really complex calculation that goes into what gets you the luxury tax amount, and it it pulls in the deferred okay. the deferred compensation okay. for for factoring into that. So that that's what that is. And then the other complaint is like, well, the free the free cash flow, and now they can do more with the money. But that's also a little yeah. blown out of proportion because you do have to start socking cash away. Yeah. And then I want to defend my Dodgers for a second. Can I just sure. first do this on sure. how Dodger fans deserve this? Sure. Sure. Okay. If you look at the Dodgers. Average attendance to an average game, five thousand more fans show up per game than the second place team. It's Dodgers average. I think it's like forty-five thousand. Next is the Yankees. I think we're at forty thousand. So five thousand fans per game times eighty-one games, eighty-one home games times how much are you spending when you go to a, a Dodger game? The average ticket price is now one hundred and fifty bucks, and then you're paying concessions, you're buying some merchandise, all that kind of stuff. It piles up. That number gets to be a hundred million dollars in a year. Mm. Dodger fans have spent enough money at Dodger Stadium for us to be able to afford Shohei Otani, Mookie Betts, and Freddie Freeman, okay. all because we support our teams more than other other fans do. So for, I hate how much shit LA fans sure. get about being warm weather fans, showing up yeah. showing up late, leaving early or whatever. The fact is we show up, we pay, and we've earned yeah. a better team as a result of that. So there's my defense of Dodger fans and how much money we're spending. My only my only request would be they fix the logistics situation of getting to and from the stadium. That's impossible. That's <laughs> never going to happen. You know, that's a good use of spaceships, <laughs> man. You need we to need fly, fly over. Fly <laughs> you got to fly over Griffith Park to get in there. It's so hard to get. No, I, I'm, I'm with you, man. I'm with you. All right. Well, we're running out of time here, so I'm going to go right into what busy season really means. 
as we enter the busy season. Oh, wow. We cut, cut through some good stuff here. We've been, we've been blabbing a while. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we had a lot a lot of stuff to talk about on the bullish or bearish All right. side of things. So right into what busy season. Can, can we just do the Magnificent Seven one real quick? All right. Let's, uh, I, let's hop into I the think Magnificent that's, Seven. Since the Magnificent Seven are usually part of uh, funds, um, you know, index funds and all that kind of good stuff, I think they're going to go up commiserate with what happens with the rest of the stock market. Where the most bull case would be would be on like the second tier tech companies that got absolutely hammered during the downturn. They might have an outsized gain over the next year. This is not financial advice, mm -hmm. but if I were to look at the tech market, I would break it up into there were winners and losers over the last two years. The winners were the Magnificent Seven because they were buoyed by being in indexes and all that good stuff. And now when there's more cash on the sidelines and people are picking individual stocks, they're going to look at the undervalued stocks and that's going to be the second tier tech companies. Yeah. Not financial advice. I have to say that, right? Yeah, yeah, you do. <laughs> but, uh, so for, for those who are curious, the Magnificent Seven are Apple, Microsoft, Google's parent company, Alphabet, Amazon, NVIDIA, Meta, and Tesla. And unfortunately, Tesla's kind of holding up the rear here, but I don't know. They've got the new, there's, there is some excitement that comes along uh, with Tesla, which is the, the new Model 3, which is finally getting a, a, a re remake, mm -hmm. which hasn't been updated in a decade and now it's happening um you got the cyber truck to see if they can ramp up those sales on that side which you seen one in the wild i have not seen one in the wild yet it's weird looking yeah as much as i'm a tesla fan it's weird looking. yeah yeah but people want them and they're and people are 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 waiting in line patiently for the deposits they put down in 2019 to get mm -hmm. them so um the demand is definitely there so they've got that they're this, huge yeah it's so big yeah it's like my what do you see that when he's, let me know when you see one it's, in the wild. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, the, the the one thing that is on this, which I'll bring up since we're, we're already on it, is, you know, when it comes to the leader of a company and it comes to publicity, is the success or failure tied to Elon himself or is it less of a factor than we think? Because I, I feel like you're hearing Elon in the news and people are talking about how him saying some ridiculous thing here or, or Neuralink over there, SpaceX over here, Tesla over here. And they're like, oh, he's, he's spread thin. He's he's. he's too crazy. He's an innovator. It's, it's all over the place. But the companies kind of just seem to do their own thing regardless of, and everybody makes it seem like Elon is the driving force between the stock. And it just kind of seems like he's just in his own lane. I, I think it's, you know, he's clearly hired a lot of great people right. to be able to do what he's doing and have these companies execute. So it's all about what's the quality of the people yeah. uh, that, that he's hired. And I'm pretty confident that Tesla's run by a bunch of really smart yeah. people. And Honestly, I don't even know what's causing the yeah. downturn in the price here, but man, that is a that is a pounding down over thirty percent since the beginning of twenty four. That's yeah, woof. I think it's woof. just uh, on sale. Tesla's on sale. There you yeah, I, I did want to talk about it at one point, which was the um, the EVs in general of whether because there there is this move right now to to the hybrid, like it it was previously viewed as this like unnecessary step of like why can't we just go from gas to electric. But it seems that there's a high demand for this. People like having the little baby step in between, and there's a, there's a lot of people looking uh, for the hybrids. Yeah. But I still think Tesla is still by far like the, the leader of the pack. I mean, they set the pace. You attack the market the right way. Make it first this luxury vehicle, which is with the Model S when that first came out. Get all those people on board. Then make it marketable to the average person. Oh, I can have the fancy new modern tech car. Um, and then when others come on the market, cut prices. Cut prices, yeah. Box them out. That's also another reason for the drop here, but I think it's just a temporary thing because it was, le let me drop down the prices so the margins aren't as good as they used to be, but I think it's just a temporary thing for now. It's uh, certainly not anti-competitive, but in the spirit yeah. of winning in the long run, I would bet that's uh, yeah. exactly what that decision came down Got to. Got to win. So, so get, get, get them all their love. That's what I'm saying. So if, <laughs> if you believe it was a temporary hit to margins in the spirit of building a bigger company in the long run, then that 30% dip looks pretty It looks good. pretty nice. Pretty good. Healing. Still right, expensive, not, but that's financial. <laughs> what busy season really? <laughs> <laughs> what busy season really memes? Uh, just two little fun ones for to have us go here. The uh, the trial balance that you expected, which is this lovely picture of the Mona Lisa, and the trial balance you received, which is this also nice picture of the Mona Lisa, except it's drawn by a third grader and saved in a PDF format. <laughs> yeah. So it is that time of the year, uh, everybody. Uh, I, as you're listening to this in the thick of busy season, we feel for you. Um, yes, we do. You have our our, our thoughts are with you. Uh, but why does the trial balance always seem like a mystery? Why is it never straightforward? It's never clean. It's never crisp. You you go in thinking it should just be this clean, easy balance sheet. Do you not keep clean records over the course of the year? What what on the accounting process happens along the way? How, yeah, that I, makes it like this. I felt like each of my clients had a trial balance that looked very different. Yeah, different formats. Different. It's like. 
I don't know. Got to figure it out. Part of the fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that's, that, that does become but like, but why are, why are auditors right. very good at problem solving? It's, this is in particular. Dude, that's, the yeah. That's where the, back to the critical thinking concept, you got to figure out what the yeah. is going on around here. That's uh, yeah, number one, formatting but the yeah. trial balance and making sense of it. It just shows you how easily, even though everybody can come from the same origin story, right? Accounting is accounting. It doesn't change, but then how everybody interprets it, even something very black and white can get interpreted and, and broken. I said that everybody's got a different chart of accounts. Everybody's like, oh, I don't think that needs to be in its own account. Other people like we needed an account for every single thing this is laptop 16 inch account this is laptop 18 inch account <laughs> this is laptop 20 inch account yeah you know, and uh depends on your controller i guess and everybody's got their own they come from some some lineage and uh you kind of carry on the lineage of your mentor before you and so on and so yes, forth very good point. so this last one here from the big four tweets client we need to start the audit me send the stuff i ask for client not now. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> and that's how it always was. It was like, we got to get going on this audit. We got to get going. You show up on day one. You're like, hey, so you got the stuff ready. And you're like, we don't really have it ready. And you spend like three days like at the client site, just kind of sitting around rolling forward work papers because nothing's ready. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, we'll get it to you when we can get it to you. I'm really, I'm really busy as they walk out at 430 in the afternoon. That's a flashback to some pain. I hope, uh, I hope none of our, our brethren in auto right now are going through that challenge this late into busy season, February 1 here. So, but yeah, I just want to reiterate what yeah. you said. We feel for you. Yeah. We know the pain. We've been there. You'll make it through. Try to enjoy it as much as possible. In your experience, what has been the biggest holdups on closing the books and having everything ready? That like kind of, I feel like that kind of is your inspiration a little bit, but what's always been the biggest holdup? The, so there's kind of the day-to-day -day stuff that drives the inefficiency, which is, you know, when we help with a lot of it, but the one that the stuff that always blew up the clothes is when you had the one off, the one off things that pop up. So the big one was always like, oh, we'd want to acquire a company. And if you buy a company, then all of a sudden it's like all hands on deck getting that sorted out. So the accounting department would get really, you know, really distracted because they're having to go through a lot of the work with due diligence and pulling the operations into the fold and doing all of that. Then all of a sudden you have to audit that new transaction and you very quickly have to get up to speed on like a new set of books, a new trial balance, you're doing all this. So it was always the just, when something came out of left field, like in addition to the general inefficiencies that we see around the close, that was really where, where things blew up and, and that's where deadlines don't change. And so the only answer is you're going to work more to get that stuff done. That's, yeah. that's it. That is true. Was that your experience? What'd you, what'd you find? Well, I saw, I never even did, I never did the closing the books on the, you know, the corporate side of things. It was always me at the audit room. But were there events that you're on waiting around that you noticed like it would make things? Yeah. Worse? I mean, there was always just something else going on where there was some other, you know, if, if it was for, uh, you know, maybe it was like a P company or something like that. They're coming in and they were running through. I Like I remember being in an audit while one of the representatives from the private equity firm was there kind of like snooping around and seeing how they were kind of having their operations go. Um, you know, they, half the time it's like somebody left. Like that's the that's the worst thing you can do is in the kind of I left at the at the in January, right? Yeah. And and now all of a sudden you do have the audit, and the person you're supposed to ask for all this stuff is no longer with the person who did all of the journal entries last year is no longer there, and you're asking the new controller who just started a month ago, and they have no idea what the stuff Good. was last Good year, and they can't get to it. It the, the the personnel changeover. There's nothing. There's never an easier audit than when everything's exactly the same as it was the year before. The people are the same. The books are the same. Um, I fear change. Yeah. No, I don't want change. Yeah. I, I kind of because that was one of those things where I would look at last year's trial balance, look at this year's trial balance, put them and be like, why are the why are the accounts not matching up here? Like, <laughs> what's going on here? Like, oh, we added these accounts, we removed these ones, and I'm like, why? Why do, why do we have to do that? And that's how it happens. Hopefully, there was a good reason. Yeah. But probably not. But that uh, that concludes us up. So a little a little extra little extra gift for everybody here for the first episode to get us started on the year. Hopefully, one point five CP credits if you head over to Flow Academy. Yeah, and check it out there. Make it happen. Can we plug Flow Academy one more time. Our free learning portal with all kinds of great content around our product, general accounting guidance, and of course myself and Drew. Yeah, chatting about stuff. Got some. Want to plug that one? Yeah, absolutely. Good stuff over there. A lot of exciting content, both on the education front thought leadership stuff, and then on the entertainment side as well this year. So we're excited to uh, announce that over the course of the year as we go and uh, wish you all well. Thank you for listening. Appreciate it. Thanks for checking out the FinTech Flow. As a reminder, this episode is available for CPE credit, and you can get that at Flow Academy or on the Earmark app. Details are in the description below.